Community radio station will provide you with more information. Say Rainier Avenue Radio. Your community radio station will provide you with more information. Rainier Avenue Radio. Oh my man. Everybody goes through storms sometimes. God is. And Rainier Avenue Radio. World have a new address. We're now located at 4916 Rainier Avenue South in Columbia City, 98118. God is still loving on your community, being a blessing and meeting the needs of the people. Don't miss any of our amazing shows, your favorite community radio station. Tune in and come on down and get some free food and let us continue to love on you. Don't forget to tune in. See you soon for free food and free entertainment with God is and Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Rainier Avenue Radio dot world is your 24 seven digital media hub. Tune in at Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter and tune in apps. time it's so good we're back man it feels like it's been a long time since we've been here huh it's been like a month i know it's crazy it's crazy it's good to be back well my name is nicolette and i'm johnny you're listening to the wise action radio show with rainier avenue radio uh before we get started i just want to let you all know that rainier avenue radio is a people oriented media outlet dedicated to amplifying the diverse voices of our community we're asking you to make a difference and invest in our independent organization so that we can con- continue to enrich our community through the programs that you love we're kicking off our summer campaign to support rainier avenue radio from now until august 1st so you don't got much time left we're asking you to go and make a gift in support of our work. Go to rainieravenueradio.world and click on donate to make a gift. Every gift matters and we're working to raise resources needed to fund our programming. And we've also got the summer of community events coming up soon or, or on its way. You got the schedule right there. Thank you, Daniel. So yeah, don't forget rainieravenueradio.world and click donate to make a gift. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Back to your regularly scheduled program. What are we talking about today, Johnny? Oh, let's uh, let's chat it up about uh, some of the work we've been doing. So maybe some reflection on uh, um, our indigenous rights of nature. So we've done some uh, work in the past uh, uh, with some really amazing people uh, working with this legal framework. Um, maybe at the intersection of decolonization, we can chat about that. What do you think? 
I think that's a great idea. I think that intersection is something I really want to get into and I think would be a, a good conversation for us to, to have. So I guess first things first, let's talk about rights of nature. What is it? What does that mean? That's not something that I think is, is super familiar. I think um, maybe giving that as a definition first would be helpful. Mm, that's a tough one. That is really a tough one. I'm not a legal scholar, um, but uh, like, Rights of Nature started in Ecuador, and uh, um, has there, there's a big global movement with it. But um, like, for example, so if a community wanted to um, protect, um, say, like some sort of like land um, or ecosystem or waterway, uh, whether it be a lake or a river or just something that's really important to them, uh, uh, some natural living life form could be even an animal or a bird, you know, um, or an orca or, or what have you. Um, maybe, uh, something that's going nearly extinct and, uh, they want to, um, give it, uh, citizenship or personhood or there's other forms of, um, rights of nature that they could give it. Uh, those are like two of the primary, um, and rights of nature uh, then say if uh, rights of nature was giving to a river um, and uh, uh, a community uh, put it through like a resolution or uh, say a tribe put it through um, you know their constitution or or it, it was incorporated legally uh, um, that then um, that citizenship or that personhood, uh, if um, the river was being violated through contamination or pollution uh, by some entity, um, and you know, uh, people could uh, speak up uh, for that river and uh, say even file suit to help um, you know protect it from further violation and. Uh, uh, say extraction or exploitation or whatever it is and uh, um, yeah so rights of nature essentially uh, protects those things with the with, with the legal framework very interesting and I, I think that's something that a lot of people can get on board with even just on my walk over here today I saw on the sidewalk in chalk from nearby the train station it's like it said protect endangered species and i thought it was kind of funny that i saw that on my way here to have this conversation um i also thought it was interesting that it it said that and and it was just okay how you know and this kind of answers that how question um but i i want to make the point that we are talking about rights of nature as a legal framework you mentioned indigenous rights of nature earlier and I think it's important that we emphasize that those two things are different. They're similar, but they're different. And that's kind of what I think we want to talk about more today is like the indigenous side of rights of nature. Um, and in, in order for us to talk about indigenous rights of nature, I think it's important that we talk about decolonizing rights of nature. So this is kind of like in line with our other decolonizing episodes, if folks have heard those already. Um, so I think maybe we can get into that of, of what that actually means. Cause I think it's sort of like two, two hands of decolonizing and also indigenizing. Do you have any initial thoughts on that? Well, I mean, my logical um, brain thinks about, okay, where did rights of nature all begin? Right. And uh, um, it began in Ecuador, you know, but by whom, you know, was it led by the indigenous people? Was it led by, uh, legal scholars was it led by other community members, um, even academia, um, or was it led by government? You know, who knows? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I, I think that's something to uh, take a look at um, because if indigenous people weren't um, a part of that founding, those foundational elements of what went into the original rights of nature legal framework, um, then, you know, there's a lot of assumptions that can be made. I mean, right. what do you think? 
Right. Well, if you're not starting with an indigenous perspective, it's already starting from a colonized perspective, right? So taking a step back to decolonize by recognizing that that is the structure in which we're functioning under, and then moving towards a more holistic perspective as a form of like re-indigenizing, basically, including indigenous voices. That's not just in a tokenizing way. That's not just in a like, you know, check mark land acknowledgement, now move on type of way, but in a, a real and an earnest way that gives people a seat at the table to actually make a decision or make multiple decisions that are specific to the places that they're in and in the elements of nature in which they're referring to, because something that works here isn't going to work for where I'm from in Florida, right? So it's the same with like different indigenous nations, especially if we're talking on a global perspective of rights of nature, something that's working in Ecuador isn't going to necessarily work in Arctic Alaska. You know, it's most likely not going to. So having one size fits all isn't going to work in, in these situations almost ever. Um, so I want to, I want to talk more in, the indigenous indigenizing rights of nature um conversation and and just sort of like the things that that really entails and so one thing about me i'm going to pull references from a book so i've been reading this book called um restoring the kinship worldview indigenous voices introduced 28 precepts for rebalancing life on planet earth um it's by uh, four arrows and darcia navarez or navayas narvayas my bad um I'll give you guys a little picture here. Um, it's been really good. It's got a bunch of um, sort of short essays and conversations about what each indigenous author is talking about. And there have been some several in here that that sort of touch on this conversation that we're having. And what I've been sort of picking up on is um, your rights of nature as a Western framework, a Western legal framework has, it's sort of a uh, uh, one dimensional in a way. Whereas if we're taking an indigenous perspective an indigenous lens, it's much more holistic, like I've said before. So that doesn't necessarily mean holistic as like, oh, it incorporates economics too. Like not necessarily that, but it's it's more of um, taking a kin centric ecosystem perspective. And that is from, I believe it's uh, Enrique Salmon. Um, and it has a depth, and that depth includes things like relationality, spirituality, um, connection. It's 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 much more, um, it touches much more on on your being, your life, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, and kind of having that connection both relationship wise and also um, recognizing that like the land that you're on gives you life and respecting that. And uh, that's not something that's necessarily normal in Western society. So it makes sense under that framework that those sort of holistic perspectives aren't going to be in included into a legal framework such as rights of nature. Um, and so I, I want to ask you, like, what do you think is the most important thing about including these more holistic, concentric um, perspectives in rights of nature as like an indigenous person to then re-indigenize rights of nature, so to speak? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is a great question. And I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is indigenous sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think we, I don't know how many episodes back we talked about it, but there was so much substantial loss, you know, especially of like um, ecosystems and uh, territory, traditional territory, you know, uh, which included like water and land um, and incorporating indigenous knowledge uh, within the rights of nature, like legal framework. Right. So, yeah indigenous sovereignty, indigenous knowledge. Um, and if we're talking about like land back, say, um, you know, under like rights of nature, like legal framework, then it's like indigenous stewardship mm -hmm. again, you know? Right. Um, so I think those are important things uh, that, that, that come up. Uh, but also, so there's also this other thing that I'm thinking about too. Um, and num you know, disclaimer, I'm not a legal scholar or anything like this. And we just came up with this topic yeah. like, like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so uh, processing uh, stuff like out loud. Um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking of, okay, so if indigenous rights of nature was incorporated with you know, with, with a tribe through resolution mm -hmm. or even, amending their constitution and 
So then a tribe has sovereignty, you know, it's a legal code and say, you know, they want to protect something even off of their reservation uh, that they're able to enforce their law off of the reservation, which could, which will create, I think, some complexities mm -hmm. and, and challenges. Then it's like, okay, well, further on down the road, like what are some possible compromises or mm -hmm. um, solutions to um, help mitigate those challenges? Uh, but also like what, you know, so I'm thinking of like legal pluralism mm -hmm. uh, where say um, uh, tribal law, uh, city, county, state, federal law, you know, mm -hmm. it, it it's incorporated, you know. Uh, so um, in traditional territories, if a tribe has indigenous rights of nature, uh, legal framework and, you know, have identified this area within it and they're enforcing their law. Um, anyways, pluralism came up because I, that last conference we went to. Mm -hmm. So anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm thinking about what you mentioned of, um, you know, and through enforcing indigenous sovereignty, that there's likely going to be pushback from other legal entities like the federal government, right? Because the it would be a challenge of control in some ways, and and changing the the way that we treat like a legal framework and the way that we treat um, land as as something that is deserving of of legal protection in the same way um, that a child would be deserving legal protection, right? And and I'm just thinking a lot about that disconnect. And and it was reminding me there was a um, there was a part of this book where the author Four Arrows was talking about reviews that he had gotten on one of his books. And one of them was from Noam Chomsky. And it says, uh, the grim prognosis for life on this planet is the consequence of a few centuries of forgetting what traditional societies knew. And I'm, I'm been thinking of that because in my notes that I wrote, I just wrote disconnect as a problem connection as a solution. But just the the sort of status quo of like a disconnect from from nature capital n nature as a whole and the effects that that has sort of like on our day-to-day -day lives in in the way that we view things in the way that we view the you know land and the people and in all of the things that are around us and sort of having that disconnect culminating into something like legal pushback in something like colonization where it's this sort of force fed perspective in order to force people to comply to this quote unquote legal framework. Whereas, and, and I know that we've asked this question in previous episodes, but like who, who came up with that, who came up with that and what is it for? And like, what is, what are we trying to preserve here? Um, and I think having an indigenous rights of nature perspective pushes back on that and says, you know, like, no, we're not going to just maintain status quo and have this complete disconnect from capital and nature. And we're going to bring back a holistic perspective and, and, and make it a little bit more, um, you know, people as a part of nature, whereas it's the status quo is sort of like people separate from nature. Um, and I think discussing that disconnect is important for us discussing like decolonization because in order to talk about decolonization, we have to recognize that there is a disconnect and where is that coming from? It's coming from a, a settler colonial design in the way that we not only legally treat things, but the way that like we're, we grow up, you know, and I talked about this when I talked about my personal um, upbringing in like white suburbia in the South and how you don't necessarily have a kinship like connection with the world around you not necessarily that that's impossible because i'm recognizing you know i'm very lucky to have been able to be in nature in some way or another as a child but a lot of people aren't and then we're also grown like sort of raised in a society that like also makes you a little bit scared to be outside you know what i mean and and recognizing all of those things and like where that actually comes from i think is essential in this conversation mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. And yeah, thank you for sharing that. And uh, 
I mean, I mean, I, I, I grew up in nature and uh, in a super, you know, remote area uh, and, and village, um, tight knit community. But I mean, I, there was really nothing. It was wilderness. So there was nothing within miles, you know. And sometimes, like as a youngster, I growing up, I didn't know how big the world was. Like mm -hmm. it, I, I kind of knew there was something out there, but uh, you know, just growing up and hearing the sounds, uh, like fishing and you know, just subsistence living off of the land, mm -hmm. uh, fishing and hunting and you know, gathering like roots and medicines and berries and you know, this whole like cultural thing of subsistence living um and now um in like what what i tell my friends i'm in the belly of the beast i like live downtown <laughs> seattle you know and uh like literally like pike place in the pier like right there and uh um and i see the port you know it's huge right out my window and i see like the ferries and uh um um, and I'm remind, you know, I'm right there on Elliott Bay and then there's the Duwamish River with all of these, you know, ships going up it and mm -hmm. and you can see just all of the uh, uh, industrialization of it with all of the, the factories doing what they're think doing or, or not doing and uh, um, understanding that there's a whole coalition of like uh, um, organizations and, and, and people wanting that cleaned up and uh, even the the local Coast Salish people, um, you know, advocating uh, uh, and lobbying for those things to happen, and uh, you know, and 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 things keep operating like status quo. These, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like things are like really actually getting better. And and I think about like, oh, like what could um, rights of nature look like here? And mm -hmm. uh, and I do daily walks along the pier there and the whole park system along the water um of downtown seattle and it's beautiful it's a it's actually a good disconnect from the whole urbanization mm -hmm. uh because being right along the water and a little, at least a nature trail along there um makes me feel connected to nature but then i also think about like okay what if this bay you know the sailor's sea or even this bay um was looked at as a, a living being right you know and and it is i and i do look at it like that but there's a lot of like harm that's been done mm -hmm. you know and it's to me as i dive a little bit deeper and thinking about it and uh reflecting and and pondering about it um I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, and I look at this as a, a as a feminine too. So I look at this bay as, you know, she's endured a lot and is very resilient and mm -hmm. is very powerful and is continuing to take on a lot, you know, and, um, and in, in, in some respects is able to balance all of that exploitation, mm -hmm. all of that extraction all of that pollution, contamination, uh, poisoning, you know, right. um, and I don't know, channel it, filter it, and, and and still to some respect provide an ecosystem for fish to right. live, to right. thrive, for us to do the things that we need to do. Um, so I don't know, like, anyways, that's what you made me think of. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a great tangent. Um, and just a reminder, this is the Wise Action Radio Show with with Rainier Avenue Radio. Um, we're talking about decolonizing the rights of nature. Um, easy, easy car conversation. Um, no, that's that's a great tangent, and it's it's making me think about something that someone said when we were in Minneapolis recently, um, and and someone had said. Uh, Indigenous advocates are fighting for the benefit of everyone. And it's not just one community. It's not just one place. It's it's for everyone to thrive in, in that sort of that saying of we all do better when we all do better. Right. And I'm just thinking about the advocates for the Duwamish River 
and in the way that it's still going through, you know, these elements of um, pollution and dumping and the way that the river in the bay is still able to sort of function. And those who are uh, advocating for its health are not advocating for its health for one particular group of people. If the river and the bay are healthy, everyone who's around it are going to be healthy too. And, and that sort of being the, the crux of, of indigenous rights of nature is it's, it's not just this one pinpointed thing. It's, it's like a structure. It's this, it's this broader thing that's important. And I'm reflecting on when I lived on the St. John's river in Jacksonville, Florida, and I, I had a friend who worked in department of ecology or, or some environmental government thing. And constantly we would talk about how much like crap literally was in the, it was in the water and it was crappy water. And, you know, and then it's just kind of makes me rethink about all the people who swim there or, or, you know, boat on, along the river or whatever. But, but cleaning that up, isn't just cleaning that up for a certain person or a certain community's sake, it would be cleaning it up to benefit everybody. And I think that's, that's the most important thing that we, I think can hammer home with why indigenizing rights of nature is such a vital thing is because it's, it's, it goes beyond just sort of this short term capitalistic society framework of like, okay, let's check a box, but it's more so like, we are all going to do better if we all do better collectively. Mm -hmm. We all do better when we all do better. That's a uh, Kent Wellstone quote. Uh, that's Paul Wellstone, the late Paul Wellstone quote. So um, it's a good one. We've had it stuck in our head for like two weeks now. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps coming up all the time, but and, it's not a, it's a good one. Yeah, it comes thank up you, Minnesota people. Right. Yeah, truly. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I know we're winding down, but, but imagine if we were to think about um, rights of nature, or indigenous rights of nature um, in the the Elliott Bay area or that whole watershed. Mm -hmm. um, if we gave rights of nature to Elliott Bay or maybe even the, the orcas that come through there, you know, who knows what, like, uh, right. like, what would that mean? Would it strengthen um, the current, like, uh, like legal framework for protecting all of these living life forms, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, would it uh, undermine, you know? Right. Um, and yeah, how 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 could it help? How could it uh, support like the cleanup, or how could it support um, the restoration of the population of like uh, native fish or right. native plants, or how could it support like the the cleaning of the the water? You know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's something to to, to think about because. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, we, we need to have um, healthier environments so that we can, one, exist in, but uh, we, 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 can, we can continue to thrive and evolve in, right. but like the long term. We're all connected to it. doesn't matter how many degrees removed you are, you're connected and you can trace it back somehow. So helping something is helping yourself in a lot of ways and vice versa. Um, so yeah, thanks for everyone who's tuned in with us talking about decolonizing rights of nature and indigenizing rights of nature. Um, this is the Wise Action Radio Show. I am your co-host, Nicolette. And I'm Johnny, and I just got one more thing to say. Okay. Like, uh, <laughs> it, it, it sounds like we're talking about like healthy relationships, you know? And it always comes back to that, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we always end up back here. It's like a, we run around in a circle and then the circle ends up back here every single time. All right, um, yeah, so so make sure your friends are take care of people. Know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> take care of your friends. Take care and, of and, and it's mutual. Like you, yeah. you, there's the benefits aren't just going like one way. And exactly. It's, it's not extractive. Exactly. It's Can't exploited. be. And if it, and if it is, you need to rethink your relationships mm -hmm. <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Practice healthy communication, set healthy <laughs> boundaries. Be like, ah, yeah, well, it, it was good for as long as it lasted. But right. Yeah, we gotta, you right. know, part ways with this. Cool. Thanks, y'all. All right. Have an amazing day. This is Biko Cassini. <laughs>